All right. Well, hello, we're going to get this information party started. Um, uh, we're lucky today um, to have someone just go back. I, I, I know Jaime from actually doing in-person job fairs, <laughs> but I really think about this uh, a, a while ago, even when we used to hold them here in the uh, school district um, that was in person uh, back in, in, in these um, Zoom days. And um, uh, so everything is new, but Jaime, especially working, I worked with the continuation school here in the city of San Ramon, I felt a lot. And, I may always come through whenever asked and, you know, give the opportunity to share about his career, the things he's done and the value of uh, the trades and more importantly, the trades that he's involved in. So thank you, Jaime, for being here. I know I'm, I'm going to let you get into a little bit of the things, a little bit of your career journey and the things that you've done and uh, take it away. Thank you so much. I, first of all, I appreciate the invitation because um, as I normally say when I go on, I do these presentations, I, I wish everybody knew about this, this particular organization and what they have to offer and the different opportunities that are available. So as far as my career and my journey, you know, they, they always say that most young people have really no idea what they want to do, even right after they graduate from high school. You know, a lot of them are pushed towards college, but they're not exactly sure what they want to do. I was a little different. I knew since I was 12 years old, I wanted to be a plumber. The only problem is, is that I, I had no idea how to get there. So I wound up, you know, asking people every chance I got, uh, the counselors I spoke to back then, you know, in the 1970s uh, about, you know, these type of careers basically just kept pushing me towards the college path, which nothing wrong with that, because you know, we actually have college career path in our organization as well. But um, I, I didn't know how this worked. And then lo and behold, it actually took me Right after high school, I found out that there was this, such a thing called the uh, Plumbers and Pipefitters Union. And what I did find out that there was uh, 13 of them located down here in Southern California. And I kind of mapped out where the closest ones were to me, Los Angeles, Long Beach, Santa Ana, uh, the Pomona area, Burbank. So what I did is uh, I made it a point to go out and make an application at each and every one of those every time they had an opportunity. It took me seven years. You know, <laughs> that's not the norm, but back then it took seven years. And basically I began my career in 1983, uh, right around October. And I, I went through what's known as a four year uh, bona fide apprenticeship program that's recognized by the state of California. And the program, the way it's designed, it's really unique because it's a step-by-step -step process, basically giving anyone with either a little bit of knowledge or actually no knowledge of industry, an idea of how to go through this process of becoming a plumber. So I had none. So when I first got into the program, what I found out is it's a, it's a five-year program. You know? So I, I began my apprenticeship program. And the courses started off pretty easy. They started off with uh, some basic math courses, uh, safety courses. And uh, then it kind of just progressed after that. Once you finish the uh, first couple of years, and then they went into more of the advanced math, the computer skills, and also the specifics of the particular trade you were going to get into. One of the things that, uh, that, that we do here is we not only work with plumbers, but we also have a program for pipe fitters, for fire protection, for landscape irrigation, and for uh, heating, air conditioning, ventilation systems. And each one of those programs is a little different, but they basically kind of teach you all the ins and outs of the fabrication of that particular system, the, uh, the plan reading, the drawings, the distribution, drainage, whatever's entailed there, they give you the basic scope of what you're gonna learn there. And at the same time, you're working. You're working for a what's known as a signatory contractor who's basically paying you during the day and usually two nights out of the week, not believe it's day school, you go into school and you're learning all this stuff. And uh, once you're done with the program, what I thought was amazing is that they also have continuing education that's at no cost. So the higher you want to set your goals, it's available to you to take advantage of all these classes that are out there. And uh, I've been doing this now for um, this September will actually make it 38 years for myself. Wow, that's, yeah, that's on, that's a couple of decades right there. But um, <laughs> so like to give a little bit, um, a little bit more detail on uh, I mean, how, so how did you, how was your career ladder 
to going from being in the schooling or the five years? And can you tell us about that uh, trajectory that you went on? Sure. So, so basically, when, when, I, when I started, I became a first period apprentice. And um, I wasn't really too expected to know anything except show up to work, pay attention, and be safe. And uh, so I did that I, every day. And here's the thing is that these jobs, when you start them, you're normally starting at 7 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, sometimes 5 o'clock in the morning. It's normally an eight-hour shift is all you got. But you got to get used to getting up early because a lot of times you got to beat that traffic to get to wherever you're going, you know, so it, it, it's a process. After the uh, after the apprenticeship program, I became a journeyman. And basically, uh, I was recognized by the state of California as a journeyman plumber. And it, it, it's amazing because you have this title. But in all reality, you're not really a journeyman. It's like this. Let's put it to you this way. You go through the you go through seven, eight years of college to become a doctor, right? The day you graduate, you may be the title of a doctor, but you're not a doctor yet because you still have to go out there and practice and kind of learn all the ins and outs. We're no different. For the most part, when you get out there, you have scratched the surface on almost every aspect of your industry. And now you have to go in there and start producing. So I, I did that for a couple of years. And then uh, I was asked to what they call run work is where you basically become a, a foreman on a job. And now you have people working under you. You have apprentices, you have other journeymen, and you go ahead and you get them rolling on whatever the task is at hand. We normally show up when there's a dirt lot and you're building a 13-story building there. It's very unique. And uh, you have to make sure that you get everybody squared away and you know the material's coming in, people aren't standing around. And so, so I did that. And then after that, I, I got an opportunity to become what's known as a general foreman. Well, now I have foremen working underneath me. And I have a, a journeyman working underneath me and apprentices working underneath me. That went on for a couple of years. Then I got the opportunity to become what's known as a project superintendent, where basically now I got the general foreman, the foreman, the journeyman, and the apprentices, <laughs> right. and I'm keeping track of the entire project. And on top of that, I'm not only watching the plumbers, I'm also making sure the pipe fitters are doing what they're supposed to be doing and the HVAC guys, because I'm pretty much in charge of this entire project. And uh, <laughs> It worked out really, really well. What's really interesting about this is that uh, unlike other jobs, you're not negotiating for any of your wages because the wages are set by the local union and the membership. So when you become an apprentice, you're making X amount of dollars as a first period. And then second period, you get an increase. Third period, fourth period, fifth period. Then you turn out and you get journeyman scale. You become a foreman, you bump up a few more dollars. You become a general foreman, a few more dollars. You know, so... Uh -huh. You're never having to negotiate your wages. They're, they're pretty much pretty much set in stone there. You know? uh -huh. And uh, you're, it's all up to you where you want to be. If you're okay just waking up in the morning and going to the job, working your eight hours and coming home, that's fantastic. That's probably about 80% of our people. But then you got that top 10% that they want to strive for more. They want to be that foreman, that general foreman, or that project superintendent, those opportunities are there. You know, if you want to get into the management side and become a business agent or a business manager or an instructor or work in the training center, that's also available. And they also have training courses for that at no cost to you. Hmm. Wow. So what has, um, you know, there's, you're, you're talking about the trajectory, you're talking about the years of service, the negotiation of the union uh, within those areas. And then um, how would you characterize your position right now? Um, as it's, yeah, yeah. Talk to <laughs> well, us about that. Well, well for myself, I, 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 like I said, I, I learned that you never say no when an opportunity comes up. You know, when they ask me if I want to be a foreman, oh God, yes, <laughs> whatever it takes. Well, a, a few years back, I was approached by a business agent and he asked me if I wanted to become what's known as a union organizer, basically going out and doing recruitment, talking to contractors and talking to individuals who are not in the union, informing them of what we have and the packages that we have for benefits and wages and so on. And I said, yes. And uh, I stepped up into that role. I did that for about 10 years. And um, then an opportunity came up 
here at what's known as the Piping Industry Progress Labor Education Labor Management Trust Fund, known as PIPE. And basically, I was asked to become an assistant executive director here. And I said, yes. You know, and I had no idea what the job entailed, but I knew that it was, it was a stepping stone in the right direction. So I went ahead and I took that position. And that position also led me to work on another side of the, of the fence here, which is known as our personnel certification body, which is known as National Inspection Testing and Certification, where we do testing for individuals and certify them in the piping industry as medical gas verifiers, medical gas installers, journeyman plumbers, journeyman pipe fitters, and I'm the vice president there. You know? <laughs> so, uh, okay. so, you know, and, and I look at it this way, you know, Michael, uh, I was born right here in, in Boyle Heights in East okay. Los Angeles. And uh, I, I always tell the story that my mother gave birth to 22 children. There was, okay. uh, there was 19 of those children that lived. There were 15 boys and four girls. And okay. as you may imagine, we were a little poor, right. <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah. but I tell you, to me, I always look at this that, uh, there are so many opportunities here. The problem is we're almost like this big secret that people don't really talk about us too much because you never hear any mother say, when my boy grows up, he's going to be a plumber. Or when my daughter grows <laughs> up, she's going to be a pipe fitter. You know, that, that's, that's not in the stars because they, they, they want him to go to college to become an attorney, a doctor, a nurse, which is all fantastic. But for the most part, we need plumbers. We need pipe fitters. We need fire protection suppression fitters, you know, HVAC technicians. These are jobs that are not going to be replaced by any type of mechanical system anytime soon. You know, mm -hmm. the, the systems themselves might be getting smarter, you know, easier to be installed, but someone still has to maintain them and actually know how to install them correctly. And that's part of what our training process does. And here where I am, I get to understand all the various codes and standards that are applicable to every part of our industry to making sure that whatever is being installed is being installed correctly, safely, where it's not going to be any harm to anyone out there. That's, that's I mean, you you illustrated that, um, what that looks like uh, through um, the description of what you're saying. I, you know, there's nothing we, we um, uh, myself and people, and I forgot to introduce my colleagues, uh, Drew, who's working with sustainability, and Alice, who's been our wonderful intern, who might not be here, but she might be done, but she's been great with us as well. And, and for me, I think even part of this is to hold, I hold the trades in high esteem. And to be able to talk about that, and, and you know, it's not trying to, you know, downgrade a parent's dream. Like you, you had the perfect illustrations, but all these things are so viable. Um, with part of this series we're doing, tell us a little about, about how the things that you're doing, which is so much, uh, right? But how is this part of the sustainability of the future as well? How does, how does these trades um, connect there? Well, I, I give you some great examples. Part of our training right now, one of our biggest pushes is make sure that we get as many as our journeymen and even apprentices certified in what's known as a water quality certification because without clean water <laughs> we're not going to have a sustainable community anywhere you know so part of our training is, is making sure that the individuals who are installing these piping systems and the fixtures themselves are properly trained to understand what the ins and outs are of those particular fixtures you know it's interesting because when you think about it in the plumbing industry it is the only industry that I'm aware of that the federal government mandates that you will have it in any type of housing, urban development, or any place of business. It's mandated by federal law that you will have this. You don't have to have electricity in a building. You don't have to have air conditioning. You don't have to have an elevator, but you definitely have to have where people are gonna be dwelling or working, you will have running water and you will have a drainage system to get rid of the water that has been somewhat contaminated when people are washing their hands or using it in their facilities there. So it, it, it's mandated, it's gonna be there. And look, when we talk about sustainability, let's just take a water closet or a toilet as more people call it, right? The old fashioned ones, as they call it, used to use three and a half gallons to flush. The newer ones are using anywhere between a gallon or less. Now, 
is there much difference in the insulation practice? Not really. It's really the fixture that's different. But as far as connecting the water, the waistline to it, the vent line to it, it's the same. Yeah, but it's just a matter of knowing, you know, what you're putting in. You, know, you, you have these new, what they call prepackaged air conditioning system units. They're a lot smaller. They're a lot more efficient. Some of them are already what they call energized or already charged. It's a matter of laying it out properly and just making the proper connections. But the individuals have to know what they're doing. I got an email the other day from uh, one of the big uh, warehouses, you know, that sell all these goodies. And they had a what's known as a split system, which is a marvelous system. And they're showing a video on how to install it. And I'm watching this video and say, boy, they sure make it look easy. <laughs> but, but it's not that easy. You know? right. It's like, it's like changing a water heater. You know, is it easy? Yeah, you got hot, you got cold water, you got a vent system, you got a natural gas line. Sounds pretty easy. But make one mistake with one of those and you could create a bomb. You know, mm. so yeah, yeah, it's like a lot of the work that we do is basically it's different, but it's the same, you know, because the only thing that changes is the amount of water or the amount of air or, or the amount of electricity that a particular unit or fixture is using. And really, a lot of our classes that we teach to the apprentices and the continuing education helps us to stay on top of this. You know, we're part of what's known as the overseeing body, which is our international office, the United Associations of Plumbers and Pipefitters. They spend $250 million a year on training and education. Huh. $250 million. That's a, that's a good chunk of change. There aren't too many universities combined together to spend that kind of money. You know? but, but we make sure we put that money where our mouth is because of the fact that plumbing isn't going away. We have to make sure that we actually are out there preventing diseases, the transmission of diseases, uh, providing clean water, making sure that those, uh, the premises, when we leave them, everything is working properly, whether it's a house, a dwelling, a high-rise building, a nuclear power plant, everything has to be working accordingly so we don't have any situations there. When, as, as, um, as you guys are recruiting, right? Yes. For uh, young, you know, young men, young women uh, into this profession, what, what are some of the job opportunities and what are some of the um, uh, things that, uh, that you use as part of, um, uh, you know, bringing people in or, you know, it's kind of like what you're advertising sure. or why this is a, a good career, uh, something that uh, people can be involved in and make a career out of it? Well, first of all, there's a need. I can tell you that um, in California alone, if we had 2,000 individuals go out to the various local unions up and down California and fill out applications, that wouldn't fill the need. Because every day we have people retiring, we have people dying, or we have people walking away from the trade all in general. You know? So I mean, think about that. 2,000 people applying, and it's still not enough because of the attrition rate that we have. You know? And on top of that, when people think of a plumber, the first thing they think about is someone who walks into a home and does some sort of service work. That's only a small portion of our work. For the most part, what we do is we do a lot of what's known as uh, tenant improvement work. We do a lot of uh, new construction. You know, we also you know, build some of the major facilities out there. You, know, you, you look at downtown Los Angeles, almost every high rise building, there's been a signatory uh, plumbing and mechanical contractor working in that building with anywhere between five to 100 men working on that crew. So th there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. It's just a matter of, of the individuals knowing what it entails. Because number one, this is not a nine to five job. And a lot of people, they see the nine to five and they kind of believe that that's how this will be. Nothing could be further from the truth. On top of that, we're actually look upon ourselves as a transient workforce. Because I could be working in Los Angeles today, and I get a call from the shop tomorrow saying, hey, need you out in Riverside. And I'm off to Riverside. You know? And I might be there for a week, I might be there for a year. And then I come back and they say, yeah, we got to jump up in Lancaster. And I'm up in Lancaster for a, a month or so. You know? So it, it's a lot of mobility. You know? So you, you, you got to be able to change with the opportunities that are there. If uh, you want to work five minutes from home, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those jobs that yeah. uh, 
it, right. it's it's a great job. I mean, I tell you, to me, it can keep you in shape. Yeah, you know? mm -hmm. it can uh, keep your mind focused because you're constantly thinking. Because when you look at a system, it may be a water system, but it's a different location and a different installation practice. Huh. So you're constantly looking at it, figuring it out, and working out the ins and outs of how you're going to actually sometimes even design the system to make it work properly. You, um, as we've, you know, during our own little, say, uh, our succession of questions here, you've been able to answer some of the questions that um, yeah, we haven't got to ask yet, but uh, you've already did it in your answer. But I would like to highlight, what do you feel, or where do you, how could you talk about a little bit about the support for a young man or young woman that, or a, a seasoned adult uh, coming in and wanting, like, what would be those things that um, would not make them feel alone during this process of, of you know, trying you know, to uh, get on? Asking questions. Uh, you know, th there's a couple of programs out there that, that can teach you some fundamentals about our industry. You know, the, you know, I know Santa Monica Community Education has a plumbing course. It's, it's online for about 146 hours, right? And uh, LA Trade Tech has an associate's degree. They have two, two associate's degree actually in plumbing. The big difference there is that you're basically going to school. You're not necessarily working for a contractor anywhere. You're kind of just getting your education there, you know, which is fine, no doubt about it. Uh, with ours, you're, you're getting the education and the training, you know? And on top of that, when you're out there working, you have someone working with you that you can always turn to when you're not 100% sure on how something should be installed or how something should be strapped up or something should be demoed out. So you can ask questions to that particular journeyman or even sometimes an apprentice who's maybe a couple of years ahead of you. They can help you. And another thing that I think is really, really, really great is when you go to school at night, everybody in that classroom is doing the same thing you're doing, but a different location for a different contractor. So you get to network with these other individuals and ask questions there and say, you know, I was at, you know, I was at work today and this is what happened. Oh yeah, you know, that happened before and this is what we did, you know? Or you can ask the instructor, you know? And I'll tell you, a lot of them are, are pretty helpful. I, I was actually an instructor for five years and uh, what I did in my classroom, I was actually uh, teaching the uh, design and installation of natural gas systems. I was teaching it on a Wednesday night. When I felt there were certain students that really weren't comprehending what was going on there, I would give them my home address and tell them to come to my house on Saturday morning and I would feed them breakfast and we would have a little extra session there because you know? I didn't want them to fail because their success is my success. And the way I look at it, Michael, is that someday that kid might be working for me. So I want that young man or that young lady to be able to do the installation practice as it should be. So if it takes a couple hours on a Saturday or a Sunday on my own time, it doesn't matter because I want to help them succeed. Hmm. When you have, you know, as, as you talked about the aging out, the attrition, the retirement, um, the sunrise and sunset, you know, <laughs> yes. um, what has, what would be the, per, if there was a, what would be the ingredients or the things that you would like to see in people to, 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 um, uh, the you know whether soft skills or attitude. Well, what what do you would hope to see from somebody who could be green, don't know anything, yes. or know a little bit? Like you know, talk to me a little bit about that. What would you want to see for those who are trying to get in, and okay. what kind of characteristics you would that you can work with? The the number one I'm going to be looking for is a proper willingness, and, and let, let me explain to you what I mean by that. When when, when you walk into your home and you walk into the kitchen and there's a pile of dishes there, if you just look at those dishes and go, huh, then what you just proved is that you're willing to put up with the pile of dirty dishes, okay? <laughs> but if you walk in and you shake your head and you start to wash those dishes and not only wash them, but you also dry them and you also put them away, then you got the willingness to take care of business. Oh. That's what we're looking for. Someone who's got the willingness to show up to work on time, 
and to also want to learn. You know, when I go do presentations and I go talk to um, individuals who believe they want to be in the construction industry, and I ask them, so how long have you had this, this desire in that time? Oh, man, you know, for the last two, three, four years. And what magazines are you subscribing to that pertain to the industry you want to get into? None. What are you reading that none? Then you're really not that interested because you're not showing me any type of willingness to get ahead of the game here. So what I want is someone who's willing to go above and beyond, you know, to show up, take care of business, and just give me give me your all while you're there and ask questions. You know, and when you go to school and if you don't understand something, I want you to come to the job site and tell me, you know, last night we talked about X. And I don't get it. No problem. We'll talk about this during lunch or, you know, this, let me explain to you right now because it's this easy to me, you know. You know, so I just want someone who, who really got that, that eagerness to really be that person that's going to make my job easier, you know, because right. they're going to they're gonna be producing. Huh. That's... <laughs> Yes, that that um the, the doing the dishes. I love your analogies, right? Don't leave them there. Um, yeah, it's the willingness. Really to, yeah, there. That's 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 the first time I've heard it that way, and it's gonna stick with me. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, um, we have people here on the call with us. Uh, I'm gonna pass it off. For whoever wants to ask Jaime a question, feel free to to um raise your hand or uh, take yourself off uh, mute and feel free to ask him some questions and um, and then we'll, we'll circle back. Uh, so who, who would like to ask Jaime some questions here? Don't be shy. Don't be shy, show some willingness. <laughs> 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 All right, well, I'll go first. Um, so as a sustainability professional for the city of Santa Monica, um, we see a future of super sustainable buildings and the built environment and reducing our emissions by 2050. We're trying to be carbon neutral. Sure. And one of the, the main strategies there is to make our buildings very energy efficient and utilize you know, heat pumps. And I'm really glad you mentioned split, mini split heat pump HVAC systems because we see that's pretty much the typical HVAC system in any new construction that we see. And so I'm really glad your workers are working on those high efficiency heat pump systems. We'd like to see more uh, heat pump water heaters go in as well. Um, I guess, can you talk a little bit more about the continuing education and how you guys keep up with the, the most efficient equipment? And do you have partnerships with uh, manufacturers to uh, work on those uh, trainings? Yes, we do. We, we actually have quite a few uh, manufacturers that um, whether they're making HVAC systems or they're making a, a simple valve or, or piping or any type of new pipe that's coming out, we basically get a hold of the sales rep there and we invite them to our school to, to give a, a, a spiel of what they do. What we really like is, um, Give you an example, in, in the arena of medical gas, there's a, a system called lock ring. So basically, it's like a compression type of system there. Well, lock ring, you know, has their own, their own tools, uh, their, own, uh, their own fittings, and, the, and, you know, it's basically a system in itself. So we have that representative come to the school, bring the tool, and train the individuals how to properly use this, and actually give them a little certificate of completion indicating that they have learned how to use this accordingly. The same thing with the water heaters. You know, we'll, we'll have a, a water heater representative come in and give a spiel on exactly what are the ins and outs and also give them a heads up on a particular situation that happens. One is very common is that a water heater will be installed and a homeowner will call and say, you know, the, the uh, water smells like rotten eggs now. Well, it's the sacrificial tube that's in there that is having a chemical reaction with the water there that's causing that. So the anode rod has to be replaced with one that is adaptable to that water. Now, mind you, if you don't have that class, how are you gonna know? <laughs> so yeah, we, we have quite a few representatives that come in and speak to our classes. And then also what we do is every year, 
the United Association of Plumbers and Pipefitters puts together a training program for their instructors in Ann Arbor, Michigan. They normally have anywhere between 2,000 to 2,300 instructors attend these courses. And basically, you have almost every vendor in the world that's selling something helping teach a course there so that they not only have that face to face and the hands on practice of it, now these instructors can take this back home to their home locals and teach the apprentices and the journeymen exactly what the ins and outs are of these particular systems. Dumb. Yummy. Sorry. Boy. Feel free. There you go. I'll jump in. Uh, Plumbing is usually not my specialty. I'm on other things, but since we have you here, I'll ask some <laughs> questions. Um, this is kind of about sustainability going forward. Um, with the like water situations in California, we're going to have to face up to that, that we have like real water shortages and we're going to have to start you know, like rationing much more, figuring something else out. Within plumbing and building, like I come across this more in building. I don't get on the plumbing side of things, but I do see it. Um, do you see any systems where we may in the future have to have like almost like dual systems, like one plumbing system for fresh water and one for more recycled gray water, or like a segregation of waters? Because um, like, you know, fresh water we're gonna need, we need as human beings. Gray yes. water we can, you know, it's got soap or whatever, you know. So I'll just, that's just a question I wanna throw out. Oh, absolutely. And then that's a great question because for the most part, we're gonna have to go that route, you know, because look, I was in Australia uh, in 2019, and it was interesting to see that they catch the rainwater, right? And they, on an average, they use it four to seven times before it actually leaves the premise. And really, when it leaves the premise, yeah. it doesn't even really leave the premise because they use it for watering their plants or watering their grass. Right, right, right. Know? I know Australia. Australia is yeah. like... So, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's coming, you know, and I, I know in my, my own, you know, belief here, you know, my understanding of it, is it a lot of people feel that, well, you know, that's kind of expensive and so on and so on. Yeah, but water is not a finite, you know, thing here. It's limited. You know, the same water we're using today is the same water they were using hundreds of thousands of years ago. You know, it's just, you know, going up to the atmosphere, coming right back down. So we're going to have to figure out, you know, number one, how to limit the use, you know, and also, you know, how to use it more than once. You know, I mean, you can use it to... Uh, you know, you're washing the dishes. Okay, from there, where can it go? Maybe go into the water closet. And now you can use that yeah, right. to, flush, to flush the system. Then from there, you can go into some sort of a, a clarifier where you can, you know, use it so you can water your plants, you know. And now three times already you use it, you know. And I'm sure there's a lot more uses that we can think of. But we're going to have to determine how we're going to do this, you know. And especially in, in new construction, because in... Uh, when you start looking at you know, existing buildings, I'm sure that get pretty expensive, especially these older buildings. Look at the building that we're in right now. It was built in the, uh, I believe in the early seventies. So there's probably a good assumption that there's asbestos in here somewhere. You know, yeah. as long as it's not disturbed, we're gonna be okay. But if they decide to put a dual system in here, it's gonna be a little pricey because you're gonna do an abatement, you know, the testing, the whole bit. But we might not have a choice at that point. You know, because of the fact that uh, water is a limited resource. You know, you look across the world, it's a commodity in some countries, you know, where it's a moneymaker. You know, here, not yet, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but we don't want to get there. You know, we want to make sure that we can do whatever we can to, you know, take care of the water that we have. Because you think about it, they say, what, you can live a few weeks without food, but only three days without water. So we, we have to have it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I can see those type of systems definitely coming down the pipeline for us. Since we have you here, um, I have read a lot about, you know, Australia, how they, I mean, because they're in the same very similar climate as we are in the amount of water, but they're dealing with it much better than we are. You, you gave some interesting examples. I mean, what is it like there? I mean, when you saw it there, I mean, because I mean, I've read, I've read the statistics and their water management is actually. Every, pretty, every pretty home water. has a cistern or, or a water catchment system. Every home. When you look in the backyard, there's tanks back there that capture all the rainwater that they can. And, and these aren't, uh, you know, five, 10 gallons. These are a few thousand gallons, you know? So, so they, they do a great job of capturing that water, you know? And then the, the way they, they utilize it, you know, as far as 
you know, for washing their dishes, washing the clothes, you know, and the, you know, the, the, the water at least goes through at a minimum four different cycles before it goes anywhere, you know? And I, I was just, I was, I was blown away. You know, and what's interesting though, is that unless you're paying attention, you don't notice it, you know, it, it just looks pretty normal, you know? And, uh, you know, I'll tell you the only other thing, uh, I guess outside of plumbing that I noticed about Australia is that the government regulates uh, the intake of sugar over there. So like they don't have cocoa puffs and frosted flakes. So it, it's, it's interesting how fit the people are. <laughs> like, dang, they're in shape. You know? <laughs> you know, and very nice, very friendly people. But uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely ahead of the curve there, you know, and, and they're making sure that uh, they're doing everything, anything they can because they've been through it you know you they have these monuments that uh recently got almost destroyed because of a couple of wildfires they had but with the limited resources of water they really couldn't do much about it you know and you and you think about that's like wow you know because we don't think about it i mean the water system goes through our streets is not only the same potable potable water we are drinking it's the same water that's being used to put out fires you know and, uh, you know, how many gallons are, are going literally down the drain at that point, you know? In some cities, I know that they have uh, dual systems for that, but I understand that, you know, some, there are some issues with it, but I'm not all that familiar with what they are, but. Mentioning that, I've read about that, that, I mean, just statistically, if we collected whatever water came into LA County, that we could actually almost sustain ourselves with, you know, with, you know, reductions, you know, around, but. Yeah. Just like like you said, with cisterning, and then Drew, I guess maybe you can address that too, because the city has the cisterning program, right? I mean, um, the library has a cistern, and then there's one at Los Amigos Park, isn't it? Is that one? How's that going with that that, that cistern? Hmm. Yeah, all, all all new construction. Um, we have uh, urban runoff uh, mitigation strategies. People have to do, you know, either install a cistern or other stormwater capture device. So definitely new construction is addressed. Mm -hmm. um, Jaime, I would like to ask you about, um, it's interesting that your union encompasses many different uh, skills or maybe sub-trades, I don't know you'd call them, but yeah. mm -hmm. um, when someone enters your program, do they learn about all of them and then they select where they want to focus their career? And a follow-up question is, is there a transferability of skills? Um, say, could a pipe fitter switch over to be a plumber fairly easily or work in refrigeration fairly easily? Or would it take another year or two of education to do something like that? Well, I went through the apprenticeship program as a plumber. And uh, when I finished the apprenticeship program, I worked three years as a plumber. And then I heard this rumor that this fitting work was coming up and they were going to be busy for the next 10 years. So um, I didn't really know very much about fitting. I went to my local union. I asked my business manager if he was okay with me auditing the fitter classes for the last two years, because that's kind of where they get the bulk of their, the real hardcore training for the fitting. And he said, yes. So I did. I, I went to school for two years again on my own. And I took those courses, learned a few things. Some of it was kind of repetitive, but there were a few things I learned that, oh, wow, well, we never did that in plumbing, you know? So I did learn a few more things. And um, I tell people that I'm a, you know, I'm a plumber and I'm a fitter, but I'm more of a counterfeiter than anything else, you know, because <laughs> uh, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, you know, but uh, I can certainly do the work, you know. Now, when it comes to the HVAC side of the industry, that's very technical. It, 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 it is quite different. Um, I, I know this much, you know, I, I, have, I have two sons in the trade. One of them is a journeyman plumber, and uh, he's actually a foreman for one of our large mechanical contractors here in Southern California. The other one is an HVCR technician. He lives in Northern California. And when I speak with him and the language he uses, it's quite different than what my oldest boy and myself talk about. You know, so there, there's a, can someone try and, you know, move into it? That'd be pretty tough to go from being a plumber into an HVC technician, in my opinion, you know, but we have individuals that go from fitting to plumbing and from plumbing to fitting. And then we also had some plumbers that, uh, decided to go into the uh, fire suppression side of the industry where they went out and they started working for the fire sprinkler local. And, uh, you know, cause we have 13 local unions down here in Southern California. So we have what's known as a straight line plumber union 
which only has plumbers. We have a straight line fitter local union, which only has fitters. Then we have a straight line landscape and irrigation and utility, which has landscape utility workers. Then we have the fire protection. And then the rest of the local unions are known as combination local unions where they have plumbers and pipe fitters that belong to that particular union. I happen to belong to a combination local union in Pomona, California. And um, we probably have about a thousand members out there. And uh, I'm gonna say probably it's almost uh, about 60% are fitters and the, the other 40% are, are uh, plumbers. You know? And then of course we have our apprentices in there as well. And normally when we have apprentices, um, because we're a combination local, they're not fitter or plumber apprentices, they're apprentices in the piping industry. That's the way they kind of at, at the local I belong to. Now, if they belong to the plumber local, then they are strictly a plumbing apprentice or the fitter local, they're strictly a plumber apprentice. I mean, a fitter apprentice. Mm -hmm. Any uh, uh, more questions for um, Jaime before Jaime starts asking some more? Yeah, I have a question. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for um, talking today. Um, my name is Gina. I'm with the Clean Power Alliance, which is the community choice aggregator for Los Angeles and Ventura counties and some cities within it, including Santa Monica. Um, and we are looking at workforce development opportunities right now and ways to green um, the existing workforce. And you mentioned this water quality certification um, that, that folks can get. And I just wanted to know more about that. Like, what can people actually do with this certification that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise? And then are there other certifications like this that exist within the, the union that folks can get? Yes. So as far as the water quality, what happened is that um, the American Society of Sanitary Engineers has developed a standard having to do with water quality. So in the standard itself, it basically outlines what an individual should know about that system when it pertains to metals, chemicals, and bacteria that may be in the water. So what they would do during the training program is show them how to take water samples using the kit, you know, where those samples would be taken, how they would be handled, how they would be shipped off to a third party laboratory because we're not testing anything. We're just doing the analysis there and we get it off to a lab that's a, a true third party. They do analysis, bring back the information to us. We take it to the owner and say, okay, here's what, we, here's what was found by the laboratory in your water, X, Y, Z. If it's clean, okay. But if there's something, there's a problem, we need to let them know what the problem exists there and what the uh, remediation would be during that process there. So that, that's kind of in a nutshell, that's what the water quality certification program does. And it teaches individuals the proper PPE they should be wearing while they're out there, you know, and uh, also some soft skills, you know, when, when they're out there dealing with the customer. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty good program. As far as uh, other certifications, we probably have, I'm gonna say close to 40 other certifications. You know, we have, uh, you know, training in uh, certifications for computers, CAD detailing, um, medical gas systems, uh, back, uh, backflow prevention systems. And I mean, it, it's quite an extensive list. And the opportunities uh, come up with, the beauty about it though, is that once you're a member and you're a dues paying member of a local union and you decide to take any of these classes, uh, they're available at no charge to you. So if someone wants to get a water quality credential, all they gotta do is sign up for the class, take the course, go through the process, pass the examination, which is put on through a third party, and now they have a certification indicating that they have uh, some basic knowledge in that particular field there. And we also have an ICRA program in teaching individuals about infectious control. You know? and, and again, they, they, they learn the proper protocol because so many of our individuals are out there working maybe in healthcare facilities and uh, they need to make sure that when they're doing their setup and everything else, that they're not creating another problem there. So there's, there's quite a variety of certifications that the individuals are, are eligible to take if they, they like. And whether they're a plumber or a pipe fitter, they're open to all of them. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any questions for Jaime? Looks so like you got a hand up there. <laughs> got a hand? I, I, oh, while, yeah, while, I, while we have, <laughs> while I have you here, I got I, I, one other question I was thinking of also. Um, my specialty is more in materials, like building. I come from a welding background. Um, but 
One thing I wanted to ask was in piping, like currently, are there any new materials? Because we shifted kind of from metal piping. I mean, well, originally Roman days, you had, you know, go from ceramic to lead, you know, lead, we found lead's bad, you know, then you have, you know, galvanized steel, which now that's probably not so great after 50 years of that, because that's corroding out of buildings, copper piping, that's too expensive, go to PVC and stuff like that. So that's, you know, that's a plastic. And that's, we're probably going to find that's going to have an issue at some point. Do you see a new natural sustainable material being used in piping of buildings or do you foresee one? Because eventually we're going to have to, you know, we're going to pull out all the PVC pipes and recycle all that stuff. So. Right, right. So. <laughs> you, you know, I, I tell you that, I mean, for, for the most part, I mean, almost everything we we put in for the last oh, up 10 years has been copper. You know, uh, normally it, it used to be soldered, then it became brazed. And now they're using what's known as a pro press uh, fitting, you know. So the the uh, the joining system has changed, not so much the materials. You know, I mean, there, there are other PVCs and CPVCs that are out there. You know, uh, PEX piping is another one. I mean, copper is great. I mean, as a, as a metal person, I love. Sure. I mean, anything like that is great. <laughs> but you know, whenever I see like residential stuff, I mean, it's always plastic nowadays. Yes, I yeah. always see. Yeah, and and, and, and you know as long as that particular material has gone through the process of being properly tested and listed, you know, they are anticipating no problems, but who knows what happens, you know, uh, down the road. You know I mean? The, I, I can remember years ago, they, they had this uh, piping system, I, I believe it was called polybutylene and which was the greatest thing until they found out that with extreme heat and cold, it, it became brittle and all of a sudden you lost your system. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I haven't heard of anything totally different. Like I said, that to me, the latest and the greatest thing that people rave about it is the PEX piping and the ProPress being utilized with the copper piping system. Mm -hmm. Since we have you, you're an expert. I just figured out a little more. <laughs> well, I'm going to say I'm well-versed. I don't know about an expert, but I'm pretty well-versed. <laughs> you're much more expert than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions for uh, Brother Heinrich? Before, um, anyone? Okay. All right. Well, let me let me first say this. Um, uh, Jaime made a big uh, impression on me a, a while ago. If I hadn't already went through a master's program, uh, the way he presented things made me think I could be a wonderful uh, plumber. Uh, journeyman, um, and he did something that hasn't been done uh, for me yet, which was he had, um, I still felt Jaime's energy through Zoom. You can, he was a very welcoming person uh, and uh, a, a, a great uh, uh, amount of information, uh, but he also makes things simple. So he reminds me of, of my fellow buddy, Mike, who made me be like, wow, the trades are super cool. And uh, the people that um, are involved with them are even cooler. With the, even that being said, um, Jaime, could you, I like to, you know, at the end, you already baked the cake uh, or made the present. You can put the, put the bow on the present or the icing on the cake, uh, how you would like to summarize your time with us and, and you know, uh, drop a, a gem of why, um, this is viable. This is an op. This is a career, and uh, more importantly, uh, why people should get involved. Well, a couple of things. Know. Number one, it, it it truly is a career. It, it's something that uh, no one can ever take away from you. It's something that's not going away. So no matter what, even when you retire, people always need a plumber. You know, <laughs> and, uh, you know. I tell you, I actually hesitate when I meet people and ask me what I do for a living. I said, well, I'm a construction worker, and I left it at that, because if I said I'm a plumber, hey, I got this problem, you know, and there I go, <laughs> to, to go help out, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I tell you a couple of things that, that, that really, um, for me, what I find truly amazing about this program is really how easy it is for the requirements, because if you have a birth certificate, a social security card, a high school diploma, or a GED, and a valid driver's license and reliable transportation, you got it, you know? And if you want to go to college, we got that. 
I actually have an associate's degree through this program in industrial training that I, I took. And then I also got a bachelor's degree in labor education through this program that I took. And we also have a program to get a, bachelor, a, a bachelor's and a master's degree if someone desires to get one. You know? So I mean, the, the sky's the limit. It, it, it's um, where do you want to be? What what do you what do you want to do with this program? Because uh, when I first found out about it, and I saw what was available, I said, "Holy smokes!" Uh, and and how much is this going to cost me? You know, a couple hundred bucks to get into the program, and that was it. The classes were paid for. All I had to do was show up, take care of business, and then continue forward if I wanted to. You know, during my presentations, I actually show a picture of last year's winner of the Westminster Dog Show. And I asked the classroom, I said, okay, who's this? And of course, nobody knows who it is. <laughs> so, this is King. King won the dog show last year. How many, com how many competitors were in that dog show? And you know, well, a couple hundred. This, I said, try over 2,300. I said, now, mind you, how many winners do we have? One. What separated King from all the other dogs? The same thing that separates us from everybody else, our training, right? And our education, you know, because we got training and we got education, we too can be the top dogs because we now have more pedigrees than the other guy who's out there. When we have over 40 different continuing education certificates that you can get under your belt, and if you got 20 of those, you're far and above beyond the average guy who, or girl who calls himself a plumber or a pipe fitter. You know? oh. And it's all up to you. You, know, you want to be top dog? Get your pedigrees because you got the training. <laughs> right. 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 I think um, thanks for uplifting the trades today, answering the people's questions. Um, I know that when we put this on YouTube, well, I, I, I'll reach out to, uh, I mean, I know Drew was taking notes and, and we'll put all the links that people can get on to even, uh, you know, uh, have a more intimate uh, introduction into um, the piping industry. Uh, and I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to Brother Shane, because uh, when I reached out to Brother Shane to do um, this, Shane Peters, who works with the city, he was like, hi, I was like, hi, man. So, <laughs> um, it reminded me, I was like, yes, thank you, Shane, for bringing this. So, um, I mean, thank you for being here today. And thank you all for coming. And um, have a good day. Well, thank you. This was uh, this was very nice. And I tell you, people ask me, they go, "Do you ever get nervous when you when you speak to people about this?" I said, "No." I said, "Because when you give someone a gift, you can't get nervous. You want to give it to them, and that's the way I feel. I'm giving a gift here because I want people to know about what I have. Because I want everybody to have what I have." That's right. All right, there goes the bow. Thank All you, right, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, brother Jaime. Thank, Thank you, you all for coming. <laughs>